So let me introduce you all to David Holm, CEO and founder of Exigent Group. David is a qualified KPMG ACA and provides commercial direction to Exigent's global clients. He does it by drawing on his experience of being a board director on more than 50 organizations and having been in the industry for a long time. For Exigent's clients, he helps identify growth opportunities and has a great track record of getting top and bottom line results for them. So please do tap into his wealth of knowledge during the webinar with your questions and even after the session. So over to you, David. <clears throat> Thanks, Samson, and um, thank you for introducing such a, a kind uh, introduction there. Um, I'm joined today by, by Dan Logan. Um, Dan spent uh, 20 years in transactions as a practicing lawyer um, in Canada, including some extremely large and significant transactions. But more recently, um, is a founder of McCarthy Tetro's um, business, transa business transformation team, uh, which is a, a fairly new initiative in Canada. In fact, was recognized, I think, in the Financial Times in London as being a, a leading um, <clears throat> light in the transformation of the legal industry in Canada. So, well done, Dan. That was a pretty, pretty great uh, sort of feather in your cap. Thanks, David. Really good to be here today. So, so um, if we could just move on to a, a quick um, overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, as, as ever with these, um, the, these slides, we don't tend to read them out. I, I'm gathering most people can read. Um, <clears throat> so really the theme of, of today is that uh, contracts are really about business and not just about legal. And in order to deliver that, we really need to... Um, build a comprehensive business strategy that will deliver value to, to the business. Um, Dan, you, you, you've been sort of in this industry for a while. Contracts as a business, is that, a, is that a, an unusual concept? It's, um, it's a concept that I think is, is uh, growing in the minds of business. I certainly don't think historically uh, commercial contracts have been viewed um, as uh, having the importance that in today's session we're going to stress that they have and and hopefully will be um, convincing to our participants today as we as we get into the details around why they're so important so, so the key takeaway really is contracts are about business and not about legal absolutely right so, if we could move. so just a quick Roundup of, of webinar part one. We, we, this is the second in a series of three. Um, webinar one was um, attended by uh, a huge number of people, actually from across the world, as is this one. Um, it was I was joined then by a senior partner at Morgan Lewis from the United States, talking about looking at legacy data and really establishing some key stats around why you need a strategy in the first place. Some of these stats, will, I think, you'll find pretty surprising, actually. Some of them are estimates. We, we believe that in the United States alone, around $50 billion is invested in, in drafting and maintaining contracts. Dan, is that a, is that a surprise to you? So I, I was a bit taken aback by that. I um, operate, obviously, in the Canadian marketplace. That's um, an order of magnitude, I think, bigger than our experience in Canada. But I would say, um, anecdotally, I wish I could give you some data analytics on this, but anecdotally, the amount of corporate contracting work has substantially increased over the course of my practice career of 20 years. And I would say, you know, the, that value associated with commercial contracting is likewise increased year in, year out. So I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not staggered by it, no. Right. So there's a significant investment made in, in, um, in building these, this asset base there's a pretty big cost associated by getting it wrong too. Well, I think that's exactly right. And we know, and it's been a uh, long time recognized in the context of any, any M&A transaction, that one of the things that you value in an M&A deal are the, are the contracts that support the acquisition or merger that you're going through. Um, what this suggests is the beginnings of a thinking in which organizations independent of M&A transaction work need to recognize that there is a very, very significant value that's caught up and embedded in these contracts. You know, so 80% of 50 billion is a big number. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, and, and this reflect, this is sort of also interesting um, in reflecting the pre-webinar question, which, um, which suggests that two thirds of people attending this webinar believes that contracts are an opportunity rather than a more as much of a risk. 
do you think that's reasonable? That that is the key takeaway. Well, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of uh, interpretation I think that would go with that, but but what it suggests is the movement in thinking away from contracts being uh, I think as they were historically viewed really a legal asset into something which suggests when you begin talking about opportunity business opportunity into something where increasingly they're recognized as being informed by other ingredients within a corporate organization you know in addition to legal and uh, and I think that's uh, I think that's absolutely right and so if that's what we mean by opportunity I, I uh, could not more wholeheartedly agree um, so anybody who wants to look at the um, webinar one, there's a link at the bottom of that, that slide. Um, Samson, if we could have the next slide, please. So really to your point, Dan, um, and this is where we get to, to the sort of the crux of it, um, some 60% of our respondents believe they have a contract strategy in, in place. Um, what would be your observation on that? Um, so that might very well be true. I think that the interesting question is whether it's a contract strategy with the diversity of engagement that uh, that we're going to suggest is critical. And so, when you know, when we think about contract strategies, um, I mean, it's certainly the case that um, you know, organically, as a legal team comes together within an organization, like they will work out a strategy for how to get things done, and and so. If that's what we mean by a strategy, that it's embedded within a legal group, um, you know, that 60% number, I'm sure that's right. I'm, in fact, I'm sure it could be higher than that. If we mean um, cross-pollinization with all of the corporate elements um, who have a vested interest in extracting value from commercial contracts, I think um, if it's 60% now, that, that's a wonderful result. Um, it would suggest, in my mind, that, that there's been a move in the sophistication of enterprises. Um, and what I'm, what I'm drawing from is it's certainly historically been very much the case that um, contracts were something that the business people would suffer through um, and that when they were completed as a necessary evil, they were put into a desk drawer, and the desk drawer was closed with a hope that you would never have to look at them again if you're a business person, <laughs> except if there were a problem. And then they were the thing to look at as if, you know, if there were a problem. What you're beginning, I think, David, to suggest here is that that's exactly the wrong way to view these things, um, and that there's so much value that's now embedded within these commercial contracts that what makes sense is to recognize all of the various uh, constituencies of stakeholders within a corporate organization who have interest in extracting that value from these contracts and ensuring that their, their role and that their input in designing a strategy around what, um, what matters most as a priority of the corporation is, is realized. Okay. And so uh, if that's at 60%, that would be a wonderful outcome. I, yeah. it, I don't know that I would say it's the experience that I've, I've seen, but again, I don't, have, I don't have hard data for you on this. Well, there's uh, it's an interesting stat. There's something like 45% um, sort of, of, of respondents also were, weren't really sure who was responsible for contracts. But they thought it was probably legal. Probably and, legal. And then some people think, think it's finance, some people think it's procurement. So generally in the marketplace, I think what we, we tend to see is some confusion. It brings me to mind of a meeting that we had with a very large financial institution where, um, if you remember, the, the head of legal sat in the same room as, the, as the, the head of procurement, and they wondered why the contract data wasn't consistent. Right. Great great example. And, and, um, and we also see it in the context of, um, you know, some confusion sometimes about where contracts are going to be maintained, who's going to maintain them and have oversight. Um, with some of our, our other large institutional clients, occasionally it's fragmented. And, you know, that creates its own difficulties and, and certainly is suggestive of, of 
uh, of a process that's evolved organically as opposed to you know something which was deliberately instituted as uh, a corporate intervention if I can put it that way so, so the key takeaways you know sales finance procurement compliance all have an equal and, and reasonable uh, interest in investing in this strategy that's uh, absolutely right and it's all driven by a unified desired corporate outcome whatever that might be yeah. you know which would be dependent upon the nature of any particular organization whether they're regulated not regulated you know whatever their drivers are but uh, it, it you know it shouldn't be random and it shouldn't be compartmentalized as an outcome within a single group I mean, that's that's really interesting I, I, I think what we're putting up on screen now is a kind of a five, almost a five-step process of what a strategy actually means because quite often we find that we say yeah we've got a strategy but um, it's mainly around the resourcing of contracts it's not around extracting the value and, and that builds on the point you made made about the stakeholders what would be your kind of observations I wonder if we ran re-ran the poll how many people would definitely say they had a, comp a comprehensive strategy well it's very interesting I mean comprehensive in the context of these five steps probably not but if I put it in the extreme other context, you know, or organically the way in which legal groups come together within an organization is, you know, you, you know, a company, there might be some founders, they need a lawyer or a couple of lawyers, those people are hired in, you give them supporting technology, which might be a pen or a pencil 200 years ago, or, you know, a laptop computer today, or even, or even <laughs> yeah, or even 20 years ago, or a laptop computer today, I mean, that is not a corporate strategy. Yeah. Right, but it is it is resourcing, and um, you know you've got human resources in, you've got technology now to support them, you've got a desk for them, some facilities, um, and so there is some kind of basic strategy around that. That you know these are resources we need in order to cause the business to tick over, but you know in a sense, because I think that's how any legal group comes together. What has to happen is that you have to move beyond kind of that organic um, genesis and there needs to become this kind of corporate intervention where in your slide here like the interesting point is that the first step is not the historical step of, of resourcing this and giving them a pencil or a laptop it's scoring the contract and uh, and that you know that step effectively informs it is informed by the corporate strategy again by all of the constituents and then in turn creates implications for all of the subsequent steps in these uh, remaining boxes so um, that's a that's not an organic thing that is like a corporate intervention <clears throat> which happens for strategic reasons and so whether you know organizations uh, are typically at that level I would say you know uh, is a question in large part, I think, probably of their relative maturity. Yeah, yeah we, we actually ran a, a, a sort of maturity model test in the last webinar, and there were sort of five boxes, and the majority of the respondents were in two to three. So there's, right. you know, there's resourcing, there's templates, there's an element of standardization, which is the, which is of course the beginnings, the you know, the positive beginnings of of uh, the kind of corporate strategy for commercial contracting that you're talking about. Right. And I think, you know, one of the, the maybe the, the, sort of the key takeaway from this is that, uh, you know, two, two really. One, you won't, I, I don't think you can get to step five, which is the analytics and the nirvana of the data, if you don't start at point one. No, that's a, I, absolutely correct. That the scoring and the priorities in that first step drive everything. Um, they drive your resourcing, what your resourcing looks like. They'll drive your technology. You know, the workflow should be designed to optimize it. Alerts, monitors, and the analytics are all designed, in theory anyway, are all designed to be focused on what is of highest priority and captured right at the outside in the scoring ex exercise. Yeah, so I think we're going to talk about that a little bit in the next slide, Samson, if we just move on there. Um, so, so, so talking about scoring and prioritizing, I, I, I tend to think that's quite a radical kind of step for, for many organizations. But in a sense, people pro don't people prioritize um, instinctively anyway? Is that right? 
So I, I think this is, again, an evolutionary step. Um, you know, we, we certainly see this um, amongst our clients in the, you know, in, for example, in the financial services sector who, who are really, in many respects in my mind, sort of at the forefront of commercial contracting. Um, and so, you know, there's, there is clearly now an exercise amongst uh, all of the FIs that we work with in which they are engaged instantly in an exercise that's designed to score a contract. What, what drives them because of their heavy regulatory related obligations with, the, with OSFI is often risk. And so that's, you know, that's a big aspect that they're looking at and trying to understand you know, what's required vis-a-vis -vis any particular contract. And then from that, um, as a derivative, then comes an exercise on resourcing. Um, there, there are obviously workflow implications to, to what the process that I'm describing. In other words, there is a workflow that includes an exercise around risk uh, allocation and, and risk uh, perception. So um, I, in my mind, where organizations, like the most sophisticated organizations in the market today are, are at today, is largely in an exercise that is around the workflow resourcing, the technology to support it, in order to uh, uh, be engaged in a scoring exercise and be deriving the benefits uh, and priorities that come from that scoring exercise. To me, that's where we are largely today. So, so down here, there's a slightly more controversial question. You know, lawyers are often accused of overcomplicating things. Are we overcomplicating this? No, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, uh, um, like the, the scoring exercise and the priorities can be whatever are desirable for any organization. They're certainly not the same from organization to organization. And I think um, it doesn't matter whether you're a small shop or a large multinational, like having a corporate contract strategy and recognizing the value that's embedded in contracts, like that's going to benefit everybody. Yeah. And so like what I really think is happening here is that there's just much more sophistication now around the way an organization will work with, with technology and with workflows in particular that makes scoring a possibility, whereas you know, 30 years ago, not so easy to do. And uh, and so I think that's a big element that that, that informs the capacity for this. Mm. That's, that's a really interesting perspective, Dan. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that later. If you move on to the next slide, please, Samson. Um, so, so here we have a, a straw poll, um, which asks the question: You know, um, which of the following does your organisation systematically include in your contract strategy? And um, if people could spend a couple of minutes having a ponder on that and picking the boxes, then we'll we'll come back to that. Dan, yeah. where's where's your money? Do you think? Well, I, again, I would say my money would be for sure around you know there being a strategy for human resources. For sure that there's a strategy around systems and uh, workflow that support human resources. Whether people are into deep strategies on scoring and prioritization yet is less obvious to me, and I would say uh, they, you know, it's likely to fall away after that, with you know even less around monitoring and alerts that you know that are happening on an automated basis or on analytics. So, what's your percentage on analytics, Dan? Uh, no more than 10%. How's that? Is this a wager we're making? <laughs> it is a wager, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably right. But I, I think it's fair to say that what has changed in, in recent times is that there is an, a recognition of value of business intelligence. I mean, really, two, three years ago, people were massively talking about that. Well, I, that's a great comment. I mean, I mean the, um, like the opportunity for legal groups, if I just narrow the focus here again for a second, um, in the utilization of data analytics is one in which they can begin to speak with the business about the contracts based on objective data and like every other line of business makes decisions and operates on the basis of data. And so in my mind, this is a really desirable thing where where you know lawyers can begin to talk the same language as business people 
and move away from what you know historically has been our language where where we're asked questions about a commercial contract maybe in its formation for example and we have to say based on our experience we think this or that which you know and I'm sympathetic to you know the business people who are frustrated by that and you know the opportunity now to objectify more of those decisions and show data and involve the, the business in the interpretation of that data I and mean, I just think that's a terrific opportunity so we have the we have the results in Dan and 25% uh, we've got for it, I think. That, that's that's encouraging I think um, and, and also hugely encouraging that some 75% some do have systematic systematic approach to this and, and workflow yeah and there's a good I mean there's a good alignment here between the scoring and prioritization at the front end and the analytics at the back end which which actually I think makes sense and uh, so we're seeing I guess if we looked at this and said you know where does the focus seem to be it seems to be in the systems it seems to be in the human resources which I think that does make sense um, you know because historically that's where it's been and uh, and it, the monitoring alerts and analytics are slightly higher than I would expect. So I'm going to just pose another question to you, um, which is a sort of predictive question. If you were to look forward to two or three years, what would you expect that to, to look like? So I think that like the way this is creeping is into the workflow area. Um, like this seems to be the area where large organizations are investing themselves at the moment and so like what comes to mind is there was an article published about a year ago uh, for the Royal Bank of Canada and uh, in the article one of the things that was said was that they had gone through a Six Sigma approach vis-a-vis -vis their legal workflows and had found a way to save and I think the number was six million Canadian dollars uh, as as a saving derived solely from changing their workflows and that kind of exercise we're familiar with our large uh, our large institutional clients is being focused on and trying to improve and it <clears throat> to me that's where the big exercise is and focus is right now and, and maybe I think we're going to talk about that on the next slide Samson, if we just move on to that. Um, so, so, you know, there are opportunities and, and to drive profit through improved workflow. That, that's the central sort of message that you're taking away from this. Yeah, but I think, it's, I think that's certainly true, but I, I think it goes much further than that. It's not just profit, it's efficiency, it's, um, it, it's a recognition that by instituting a workflow that is predictable, that um, has visibility over all of the relevant participants. Like, in the absence of something like this, you can't really manage a commercial contracting process. By the implementation or through the implementation of uh, a predictable workflow with the visibility over all of the corporate assets who are involved, suddenly you can manage it. You can track it and you can manage it, and you've got visibility over who's doing what, and that I think is enormously desirable. Yeah. You know, uh, so in some ways, you know, Royal Bank went to an exercise and they talked about efficiency driving down cost. Um, what we're saying is the opportunity is significantly larger by improving visibility for all those stakeholders that are, that are invested in the contract strategy. I and mean, that's, I think, that's certainly right. And you know, there, there are. I'm, I'm now thinking historically to like all the awkward moments that happen in the context of transactions big or small where you know where somebody asks the question like why isn't this done and like there's usually a big finger pointing exercise that happens because everybody thinks it's not on their desk you know the reason the question's asked is because there's often not you know historically been really good predictability and visibility over the contracting process um, I, I think a large part of what people are trying to do today is, is move away from that uncertainty into something which has got much more predictability and can be better managed. And there may be very good reasons, you know, just to kind of leap to the defense of any of the constituents, but there might be very good reasons why, you know, a contract is held up at any particular point. Um, and just 
having management, better management oversight on all of its aspects, I think is uh, you know, very important if it's going to be managed. And the reason for managing it is, again, because you've got such a high value that's embedded in these contracts. So ensuring that they're managed correctly and ensuring that they continue to align to the strategy and priorities of the organization so that you get the outcome that you want um, all, all makes perfect sense. Yeah, I'm going to come back to you a little bit on that, Samson. Could you maybe just move us on to, to the picture of what that might look like? I mean, a good example is one I always quote, which was um, from the General Council of Anglo-American Mining. He said, I can spend half a billion dollars on land, but if the $30,000 digger doesn't turn up, I can't dig it up. Right. I mean, I mean that's, that's, a, that's a crude example, but it kind of makes the point. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely makes the point. I mean, in that example, really what you're saying is that there's a project and you know the project is the result amongst other things of several contracts needing to come together all at the same time yeah. right and if you don't have visibility over how that's unfolding then you're going to be standing at the door ready to step through it only to discover that you know to your surprise you're not ready yeah. um, and so I think that that's a an excellent uh, example I mean the the other point that I would make here and I'm just sensitive to the fact that you know one size does not fit all is that you know the, there are numerous techniques in mapping a workflow I mean I think back to simple racy diagrams you know this is a more sophisticated example although you know it, it's very simplistic in terms of how you can utilize it and interface with the example on the screen right now uh, it's very desirable and and flexible in that respect but uh, my, my comment would really be again sort of irrespective of the size or relative maturity of the organization having some basic workflow I think is is very very desirable and it you know you can develop that workflow according to the complexity of what you're trying to map it against it doesn't have to be complicated if it's not a complicated process yeah, I mean, and it does come back to the central profit point. I know that profit isn't the only driver, but it is for many of those stakeholders. And and you know, if if you if you can't utilize those assets and you can't monitor them, you will not optimize profit. Well, that's a great comment. I mean, in the combination of workflow, resources, and strategy, and and the the resulting outcome of having visibility over who's doing what relative to what category of contracts and what you don't want to find is that you know 80% of your resources are spent on you know common non-disclosure agreements I mean, that would be a bad outcome and so I think you're making a very good point here that that it's through the rigor and consistency of a disciplined workflow process that and the and the oversight that comes from that that you can take a contract management strategy and actually execute on it. Yeah, yeah. And and you you spent a number of sort of years advising people on this. Do you think would you ha what percentage of of your sort of client base would have a, a, a any kind of what tool? So um, well, I mean, I think the statistic is interesting around this, right? So today, our respondents are telling us approximately 50% of the organizations. Who dialed in today um, either have this or you know are working on something which is you know which is systematic and so like I, I think that's about right like to me this is kind of if I can put it this way this is the nut that needs to be cracked right now and so if historically you know if historically it, you know it was sexy in order to have kind of newer and better technology for legal resources to help them get contracts done and, and what I'm thinking about maybe is the change in the mid 1990s to personal computers and and word processing like that was a massive system change and a massive workflow change um, we've we've all obviously graduated well beyond that but to me this is the nut that needs to be cracked now and you can kind of see indications uh, in the press and that RBC example was one of them this seems to be where people are focusing and spending their time on and in, and is sort of the issue of the moment so I think you've got another straw poll coming up on the next slide. Is that right, Samson? So, so this is the, the, the second of two you'll be to know. Um, so really the question is, has your organization implemented a business 
process at Workflow as part of its commercial contracting activity. So we're about to find out who's who's right, Dan. Your your money's on 50% plus. Yeah, roughly 50%. I'm I'm I would I'm hopeful that that's what we'll see here, because in my mind, and uh, just you know to anticipate where we're going to on this, you need this in order to get to the future state. And what I think the future state looks like is all about data, right? Right. And you can't get there unless you've got this. This is a necessary ingredient. I mean, it would be unusual for any other part of a, 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 a business doing business to not have something similar. Right. Um, you know, that, that would be a fair observation. Yeah, I, do, I think that's right. And, and I mean, I just you're asking me anecdotally what I see, I mean, when Exigent goes in, like what percentage of clients that, that you're engaged with in all of the various area, uh, jurisdictions and areas where you do work, you know, have systematic and deliberate uh, workflows? What would well, you say? I mean, what would you say that looks like? I mean, I guess we, I mean, we have clients in every major jurisdiction. I would say uh, that most of it is experiential. Right. Rather than Organic. Organic. In yeah. other words, by experiential, you mean this is the way we've always done it. We've been in business for 47 years, and we've always done it this way. And so I think that's right. I think these things start organically, yeah. right? And they, they evolve organically. Well, it can be confronting, right? Right. Because I mean, we're on site with a, a, um, a number of major corporates right now, a um, couple in Australia, a couple in the US. And one of the sort of confronting questions is how you actually deploy your resources. And um, the best way of describing it is if you've got uh, 20 years qualified, you want to make best of that. Right. Actually, that resource. They are the legal resources are the most valuable part of you know, the most valuable thing. It's not the system itself. It's how you use that experience and resource. Right. So we've got some we've got some results back. Let's just take a second to see what they tell us. Partially implemented is is sort of a high water mark. Yeah. I, I mean, I would think that fully implemented is. That, that doesn't surprise me. That maybe on a bit higher. I was, I was thinking it was around the 10% mark. Um, but but actually, you know, if you look at those results, it's encouraging that people have actually started to take, to take this as a sort of separate right. uh, initiative on its own. Yeah, I think that that's a, a a very good observation. Just in the solid nose, you've only got 18%, which means, you know, the the remainder are organizations who are in some capacity looking at this and beginning to engage on this, which I think is all support for the earlier observation that this is the nut to crack right now. Yeah. So, so really, um, that brings us to kind of the end of what I build a strategy and and sort of how, how what are the elements of a successful strategy. And um, really looking at the third webinar, looking forward now and, and to the final part of getting the benefit of all this hard work from your strategy um, is really talking about business intelligence or business analytics. Do, do you think that that's much misunderstood or do you think that people are now really thinking very hard about this? Well, you know, the, the reference to Moneyball is a perfect reference because um, for those who have seen the movie, there is a pivotal moment where Brad Pitt is sitting in his capacity as the general manager for the Oakland A's, and he's looking at his scouts, and his problem is he's got a certain pot of money to spend. I think it's $30 million, but he's competing against teams who have a $150 million budget. He's lost his star players, and the question for his scouts is, who are we going to hire? And the answer from the scouts is, well, based on my experience, this guy's got a great curveball, and he turns to his uh, Harvard math whiz, He's got all the data, and you know the guy shakes his head. And like the theory behind all of that is that you know the value associated with the ideas in the minds of the scout does not correlate to the statistics, and so they end up buying people who are undervalued. And that same approach, by analogy, is what needs to happen in the legal area. We need to move away from this kind of role where lawyers are a bit like the scouts and the business people come and say, well, what do you think about this, that, or the other thing? And we say, historically, well, based on our experience and into a role where as lawyers, we're looking at the data 
with the business people and helping them interpret it and make business decisions based on objective data. And to get there, we have to begin tracking it. And so there's an exercise that we need to go through to get there. And, and, but I think that's what future state looks like. You know, the, again, historically, where all the magic has been as a lawyer, it's been in doing the deals. You know, there was nothing better than to be a highly regarded transaction lawyer. I think that's going to change. You still need to do the deal correctly. But where the magic is going to happen now is from the data derived from the deal and how you interpret that and use that data strategically and tactically. And that's a whole new role as a legal function that does not historically exist. That's the excitement around what we're trying to do here. I mean, just to talk to a specific example of that, and I think I, mean, I see a lot of people talking about analytics in the marketplace, and, and I, I tend to wonder what they actually mean by that. I think we're very clear about what we mean by it. I mean, um, we, we are, you and I are working with a, a major financial institution that has a collection of contract assets, and I do believe they are an, an asset class on their own, um, which happen to be IT vendor agreements worth a billion dollars a year. And nobody has collated that data to say what the average cost of a license is. Yeah, I mean, there's, what there's, average payment terms are. there's that, and there's also just the recognition that this is all information that's lodged in the heads of, of disparate lawyers. You know, lawyers come and go, um, but it's all fragmented. Like all of the value that's caught up in a contract is sitting in somebody's head. And what we need to do is get it out of the heads of people and centralize it, objectify it, and make it accessible. And, and that's hugely important for making informed decisions. So procurement can actually look at the performance of the asset class, say for IT vendor agreements or for property. And, and in doing so, allow themselves or give themselves the opportunity to make an informed business decision. Is I, that I could not agree with that more. I mean, I think that's exactly right. In externalizing this data that comes from these commercial contracts, you, you make it accessible to the lawyers. They can help you interpret it. They can give guidance to the business, again, derived from objective data. I mean, that's exactly the way every other line of business operates today. And what this helps a legal group do is come into alignment with the way in which business people otherwise make decisions. And that's very desirable. I mean, that brings us back almost full circle to the start, um, which is where we talked about the stakeholders. And, and by collating and comparing data, you can actually see patterns and anomalies. And in doing so, you can, you can make better decisions. I mean, that's really the wrap up, isn't it, on, on that. And in the next webinar, uh, maybe we'll get you back, Dan. Um, we've certainly got a general counsel of international presenting with us. Right. And they, they're very advanced in their thinking on this. Like th that, I think this is an extremely interesting uh, subject matter. It, it is future state. And, and I like today's session because what it tells us is that a majority of people are taking the necessary step in order to put themselves in tomorrow where they need to be in order to have the benefit of this. Yeah, and, and, and it, it is a process, isn't it? I think you, you, you sort of said it right when you said, you know, this is a corporate intervention. Right. And, you, and, and that's, and presumably that's why, you know, McCarthy's appointed you into this role to, to look at business transformation and, and see how it fits together with business. Is that, is, it, is it, that the strategy? Is that the vision? I mean, it's absolutely right. And to recognize that, um, that what the future of contracting will look like for lawyers is going to change. And with that, our capacity to continue to give advice and to help and create solutions for our clients needs to evolve as well. Um, so, so I think we're drawing to a close. Um, <clears throat> we've, um, we'd like to sort of um, hold out an offer that if you have questions uh, that we, we can't cover now, then um, Dan and I will we'll put our heads together and um, and, and, and give you some some insight from our perspective. So please feel free to submit questions to us subsequent to, to this webinar. Um, Dan, you're appearing at the um, CCCA um, National Conference with TV Bank, I believe, to talk very much about analytics. That's right. So we've got a, a, a national conference for the Canadian Corporate Council Association is coming up in April. Uh, we've got a workshop on data analytics. And I'm, I'm happy to say, 
one of our institutional clients in the financial services sector, the Toronto Dominion Bank of, of Canada, will be joining us for that and, and to give their views and insights in this area, which I think is wonderful. So I guess um, we're wrapping up now from us. Um, thank you very much to, to Dan to, um, for, for your time. Thanks, Dan. It's been, it's been really insightful. And you know, best of luck with this fantastic venture, venture that McCarthy's have, have launched. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a, going to be fun. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you for everybody for um, joining us today. Uh, we've had fantastic responses on, on the, all the polls, both pre-webinar and during this webinar, which is hugely encouraging. Um, and we'll be circulating some of the feedback in due course if people um, would like that. So um, I guess it's good night from me and it's good night from him.